Welcome back to the Story of Liberty. This is your host, John Bona. A young man is chosen to go to Rome. He goes, and he goes to the eternal city where dwells the head of the church. He crosses the Rhine from Germany and the Alps where the shepherds are tending their flocks. He passes along the deep gorges where the water tumbles and foams to the lakes below, where the rocks rise so high and sharp and steep that at noon it is only twilight. He sees the avalanches roll from the mountains with a roar like thunder. Far above him is the icy peaks that gleam in the sunshine. It seems that he climbs above the clouds and crosses fields of snow goes over the summit and he descends on the southern slopes and finds himself as it were in another world. How pure is the air, how deep and tender a light. A blue haze rests upon the mountains. Fresh green fields, wide spreading chestnut trees. Peasants are planting their vineyards. He reaches the plains of Italy and all of a sudden he beholds the ruins around him. Marble pillars, beautifully sculptured once, are now broken down. Italy is an old land and he is acquainted with its history, how the Roman Empire rose and fell. He gazes upon the sculptures, the marble, the broken columns. And he recalls a time when Rome was in her glory, an empire reaching from India to England. He sees the aqueduct where the Romans built structure to bring water into the city from the Albanian hills. He's inspired as he stands in front of the old forum where a century before Christ was born, Cicero gave his immortal orations. He sees in his mind, I, the audience of the old Romans sitting there listening to Cicero. One of those is Julius Caesar. He has led the armies of Rome in triumph through Gaul. He has crossed the sea to the land of the angels, where men wear skins of beasts for clothing, where the Druids venerate the stately oaks and offer human sacrifices to their false god. Another of Cicero's auditors is the general who has led the armies to the victory in the east, Pompey. Pompey has profaned the temple in Jerusalem by entering the most holy place. General Cato is listening. A great man. A man with the soul so calm and serene that nothing disturbs him. Still another general is there, Mark Anthony, a wild, reckless person who fills Rome with riot and disorder. Two poets are in the audience, listening to Cicero's eloquence, Virgil and Horace. He leaves and walks along the street past the Temple of Jupiter and comes to the temple of peace. He looks up at the mighty arches of Aspasian and received the spoils which he brought from Jerusalem. And the poor Jews that he brought as prisoners were compelled to work in the clay pits, making bricks for the construction of the edifice commemorative of their humiliation. Nearby is the Ark of Titus. What a story it's been, how these time-worn stones, the history of a perishing people. This triumphant Ark was erected to glorify the man who thought he had crushed them out forever. He walks further and sees the procession of Roman soldiers bringing the silver trumpets, the golden candlestick, the table of showbread, the sacred furniture of the Jewish temple. 
escorting the weeping maidens, the prisoners of war doomed to hopeless captivity. Now he's at the hill overlooking the forum in the capital, the once magnificent marble palace with its majestic columns and mosaic pavements, courts and passageways. From this palace was once issued a decree that all the world should be taxed. And so it happened that a poor man in Judea started on a long journey with his wife to give his name to the tax assessor. He could find no room in the tavern that night. He was forced to lie down in the stable with the cattle, where during the night a babe was born. A babe of all others most wonderful, wonderful counselor, almighty God. From this same palace was issued the order for the beheading of Peter and Paul. And in a prison down the road is the deep, dark dungeon where Paul was confined. It is not the palace of the emperors of Rome, but it is the places where the Christian martyrs have suffered. That's what attracts his attention. And now he's at the Colosseum where they were torn to pieces by the wild beast to gratify the heathen populace of Rome. The Jewish captives, they built it. And the mortar of the masonry was mixed with their blood and tears. In the arena are those who would not give in to their faith in Christ. They're eaten by lions. The people look down upon the spectacle and not one heart in that vast coliseum of 85,000 people is moved to pity at the sight. Instead, there's joy to behold the hated Christians tossed to the beasts and to see the fair maidens torn in pieces and devoured. At that time, the thought comes to him, and he remembers when he was in Spain, who were roasting men by the thousands, and now they're thrown to the lions and tigers in the Colosseum. But he remembers the gospel of Christ is unstoppable. So you'll notice that while the oppressors have carried out their plans, and had things their own way. There were other forces silently at work, which in time undermined their plans. A divine hand working a counter plan. Yes, men do act freely in executing their plans, but behind the turmoil and conflict of the human will, there is an unseen power that shapes destiny. Nations rise and fall like Rome, and generations come and go. But through the ages, there has been an advancement of justice, truth, and liberty. And that is the story of liberty, that the gospel of Christ is unstoppable.